got your Bible, I want you to go with me to that little letter of Jude, that little book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation, right before the book of Revelation, Jude. And this morning we're going to look at those couple of verses, 8 through 11, and we're going to just continue in our group of messages that we've been looking at through the book of Jude, 25 verses, but really a lot to be said from this little short book. And so beginning in verse 8 of the book of Jude, here's what it says, yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesty. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, he says, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So it was Sarah Churchill that wrote in her book called Dancing, or Keep on Dancing, that her daddy, Winston Churchill, once told her that we had, to a large extent, succeeded in the civilized world in erasing the lion, and the tiger from the human soul. But he went on to say, we have failed miserably in removing the donkey. Well, there's a little bit of donkey in a lot of us. There's more in some of us, and there's a lot in a few of us. But it goes without saying that the more mule there is inside any of us, the less likely we are to live our lives the way we ought to live before God and before others. Well, when Jude wrote this little letter to the believers who were spread throughout Asia Minor, to those who were spread throughout uh, the Mediterranean world, he wrote to them for this one purpose. He wanted to, he really wanted to start out his letter uh, about all of the, the, the great things about our salvation that we enjoy. However, he found himself, because of the situation that had occurred and because of those that had sort of slipped into the church unaware, he found himself having to write about something different. And so he found himself having to write a warning, if you will. And you remember how last week we looked at those warning labels. And he, he said, you know, I, I, have, I have to write to you to challenge you to contend for the faith because he's discovered that there are those that have worked in that have have slipped in unaware and they were causing havoc in the body of Christ and so he wrote to them not only uh, to warn them about the presence of those folks that had crept in unaware those who were we would call the apostates those who had moved away from a theological position or a truth in Jesus, he said, I, I, I'm, I'm writing to you to warn you not only about their presence, but also to show you their end so that you know what the outcome is going to be for them. But he said, I, I also write or I wrote to you so that you might know how these apostates lives are going to end, what the outcome is going to be for them because of the conduct of their lives and because of the things they live and the things they espouse to and so on. And so he said, I'm writing this to make sure you know not only that they're here, that they're present, but also that you know what the outcome, the end result is going to be for them. Now notice in verse 10 what he said. He said, like unreasoning animals, these folks live only by their instinct and they actually destroy themselves by living that way. Now, what's an animal known for? What does an animal do? What's the difference between an animal and a human being? The difference is that an animal is going to operate on the basis of instinct. And we're going to operate on the basis of the intellect. We're going to intellectualize things. We're going to think through things. We're going to apply mind and reason and so on. And so animals don't do that. They operate according to instinct. And so he says, 
these particular folks, these apostates, are like unreasoning animals. They just react to what comes their way. They make swift decisions and hasty decisions based on whatever they feel in their flesh at the moment. They tend to follow whatever their fleshly desires are, very much like animals do. They follow what their flesh wants. And so Jude says that is precisely the way a true apostate, somebody who's turned back on God and they've left God in that theological state or they've left God in that true state regarding his grace and Jesus and so on. They've left him. Jude says that's precisely the way these kind of people operate. They operate like unreasoning animals. They operate on the basis of the flesh. They operate on the basis of the instinct. They, they don't even operate and connect with the spiritual realm and so on. And so he says the danger for you and me as part of that, as part of the body of Christ, is, is, is that because those apostates tend to be uh, those that are usually the most outspoken and the most obvious, if we're not careful, we'll end up sitting in the saddle with them and we'll be a donkey too. And so nobody wants to be a donkey. At least nobody chooses to be a donkey. Nobody wants to be, you know, a, a, a mule. Uh, nobody's desire is. And so, so we've got to watch out and be careful that we don't get caught up in 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 the the in following those that are most outspoken in that way. In fact, somebody's once said, if one person calls you a donkey, ignore him. If two people call you a donkey, check the hoof print. But if three people call you a donkey, saddle up because you're a donkey. And so you just need to be aware that you, 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 you have people in the body of Christ that uh, they may have the three-piece suits on. They may carry the Bible the size of an Atlanta telephone book. They may walk around and say Jesus and stretch God out in the three syllables. But just because they use that language and look like you and talk like you and walk like, like you does not mean they're one of you. And it's easy to get caught up in their spell and to get mesmerized by their ability to speak or their ability to teach or their ability to draw a crowd. And in doing that, you will get sucked down the wrong path. And so he writes to caution us. And he writes to warn us about the presence of these kind of people in the body of Christ. They make bad decisions based on their flesh, on what they feel, not on the word of God, not on the truth of the Bible, not on the truth of what Jesus says, and they lead others down that dark, dangerous path in the body of Christ, ultimately away from Jesus and more towards personalities and people and everything else. So you have to be careful, and that's why he, he writes. So there... There's error in, in the way they live and in who they are. Now, the question is, what's the error? And why are, so, why are they so dangerous to a church or to a group of people or to a Sunday school class or to the body of Christ? Why are these kind of apostates, those who turned back or they use different language when it comes to the grace of God and to Jesus and so on, why are they so dangerous? To the body, and here's why: because they live according to three different errors. Three errors. First, they live unrealistically. According to Jude, verse eight, they live unrealistically. The Bible says, "By dreaming." Here's what these guys do: by dreaming, they do three things: they defile the flesh, they reject authority, and they revile angelic majesty. So, so look at those three things right there. Here's what they do. By dreaming, these men defile the flesh, they re reject authority, and they revile angelic majesty. But notice what the reason that they do those three things is. The reason they do that is because they, leave, they live in this sort of dream world. It's sort of a dream state, if you will. In fact, the word dreaming is translated from in sleep. If you were to translate it literally, you would translate it from within sleep. The idea is like they're sleepwalking. It's almost like they're in a dream world, and it's almost like they're, they're just up and about, but they're in this dream world that exists, and, and it's not a real world. It's more of an illusion they live in, but they live in this, or delusion that they live in, and it's just this dream existence. Now, I don't know how many of you dream very often. Most of us do, some don't remember, some do. 
but dreams can either be this really frightening thing or this fulfilling thing, depending on the kind of dream that you're dreaming. But according to folks who study dreams and the dream concept, most of them say that most of us do dream. You may just not remember it. But what seems like, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but have you ever noticed how dreams will seem like they've gone all night long? You ever notice that? You, you, you think that you've been dreaming this since you fell asleep. But in actuality, most of those scholars that study dreams will tell you they're not more than about 12 to 18 seconds. Now think about your last dream that you had. Again, it could be good, could be bad. I had one last night. It was the weirdest thing I've ever had. I mean, I had a little shack. Y'all know my little dog Shack. I was in the basement of a church running after Shack. Why we were there, I don't even know. And I don't, It was a different church, some church. They had a basement. I couldn't get him. Every time I went to pick him up, he would bite me. And every time, and so I couldn't get him, so he took off running again. He went and jumped through a door that happened to be swing, swung open, fell down almost 18 to 20 flights of steps, and there was water in the basement of this church. So my little dog Shaq was floating around down here. Now, this was my dream last night. Now, what seemed like all night long I was chasing him, trying to get him, probably wasn't more than about 8 to 10 seconds. But that's how weird my dream was. Now, here's what's interesting about dreams. What's interesting about dreams is most of us have them. Most of us can remember them, but some cannot. But the other side of it is that the, the, what's interesting about a dream is it does not take into account time, space, or matter. So all of the natural laws that God has built into the universe, all of the natural scientific rules that are built in, you know, I can't, I can't just uh, time space, you know, time lapse from here to there. But yet in my dreams, I can. I can be over in some city or some town or some state or some country preaching like the best sermon you could ever be preaching evangelistically. I could be Billy Graham over in some country around the world seeing thousands come to Jesus, and at the same time, three seconds later, I could be in, the, in, 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 in Atlanta, in the Superdome or wherever it might be. I could be running at the five-yard line for right about to make the touchdown for the Atlanta Falcons in the Super Bowl, the winning touchdown in the Super Bowl. Now talk about a dream world. There you go. I mean, I could literally, because you don't, it doesn't take time, space, and matter into account. If you're in a dream, you can just you can go time warping anywhere you want to go, and it doesn't matter because it doesn't take into account those kind of things. Well, that's the thing about what Jude is saying about these folks. That's the way a dream is. They live in this sort of dream world. It's not real. It's unrealistic. It doesn't account for time, space, and matter. And Jude says, this is exactly what these fellows are doing, thinking that they can, thinking they can call themselves Christians but live without any kind of reference to God, uh, live without any kind of accountability to God, and yet call themselves Christians. And he says they're just like unreasoning animals who think they can live in this world, be who they want to be, do what they want to do without any account for God in that world. Animals don't care if there's a God. They don't bear any reference to God because they're animals. And they don't have any capacity to relate spiritually with God because God didn't build them that way. He didn't create them that way, but he did us. And so Jude says just like that, if we think we can call ourselves Christians and live without any kind of limitation or accountability before the Lord in our lives, then we're just as unrealistic as they are like unreasoning animals. Our life is not an island. We're not a life lived unto itself. If we call ourselves a Christian, then guess what? We answer to God himself. And if you don't want to answer to God and be accountable to God, then you don't call yourself a Christian. <laughs> you don't be one. Because to be a Christ follower means you answer to the Lord. And you follow the Lord. And you obey the word of the Lord. And you obey his, his teachings and his statutes and so on. So it's absolutely unrealistic to call yourself a Christian and think you can live without any reference to God in the way you live. And yet that's what these fellows do, Jude says. They live in this dream world, Disneyland, and they, they, they live unrealistically. And the proof of it is, Jude says, these three things happen. They defile the flesh. 
which simply means they feed their flesh over and over and over. They keep feeding the flesh. So you remember Otis, Andy Griffith? Remember Otis? You remember the Otis complex? Remember it didn't matter? It didn't matter that Joker every time he'd go dry. Where did he keep that one last little bit? You remember where he kept it? Under the flower pot, or in the cabinet. It was under the flower pot most of the time when I saw him. And it's uh, every time he was going to go dry, he did. But he always kept him a little something. Well, that's what happens when you feed the flesh. You always account for the flesh. You always make sure that you leave you a little something in your back pocket or in the cabinet or under the flower pot or whatever so that your flesh can be fed whenever your flesh wants it. You never want to not feed the flesh. And that's what they were doing. They were just feeding the flesh. They were feeding the flesh, feeding the flesh. And that's what happens to these who would be classified as, as apostates, those who've turned away from God. They just turn to their carnal appetites, their own carnal desires. And whatever they can dream up in their flesh, that's what they want to keep feeding themselves with. So now you can look around. You can look around in the larger scope of the body of Christ. You can look at some guys on TV today. You can look at evangelists and those guys and think about their carnal appetites. Think about feeding the flesh. I mean, who really needs six mansions at about 8.9 million apiece? I mean, who really needs that? Who really needs these jet airplanes that are $70 million a piece. Who really needs that? The, the point is that they feed the flesh, and they always are feeding the flesh, and they're always feeding the flesh. They defile the flesh, and that's what these kind of guys do. Not only that, but they reject authority. They refuse to be mastered or influenced by anybody other than themselves. They're going to live their own will, their own way, how they want to do it, and that's what he says. He says, these are guys who defile the flesh, and they reject authority. They don't want anybody telling them what to do other than themselves. And then they, rege they revile angelic ministers. The word is glory uh, there. They revile angelic glory or majesty. It's a reference to anybody that God assigns to be a minister to you. So, so remember, according to the book of Hebrews, God assigns angelic beings as ministering agents over our lives. Now, that's a good thing, right? That's, a, that's an honorable, that's a great thing to know, that God has assigned angelic ministries as ministers, as servers to us, to protect us, to oversee us, to guard our steps, and so on, according to the book of Hebrews. Now, that's a, that's a good thing and an honorable thing. But Jude says this. Jude says these apostates, in their pride and their arrogance, they actually speak railing accusations. They actually speak unwarranted, unsubstantiated judgments against the very ones who God places in their lives as ministers to their lives. And so he says, look, to show you how senseless they are, not even Michael the archangel would do that. He, he wouldn't even pass judgment on Satan who deserved judgment. He wouldn't even pass judgment on Satan who tried to collect the body of Moses when Moses died. Instead, he said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't try to rebuke him himself. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And so Jude says, look, this, this is how unrealistic, this is how senseless these guys are. This is th these, these folks who've never really been saved in the first place. Don't have a relationship in the first place. He says, they want to call themselves Christians but they want to remove any residue of God's authority over their lives. And Jude says that is completely and totally unrealistic. It's like a dream, and it violates everything that is real and true in the Word of God. And so Jude says, first of all, if you want to know the error that these guys live in, ladies and guys, that these folks live in, they live in this error constantly, of, of being unrealistic. They live in a dream world, if you will. It's sort of an illusion, and it's their own world that they live in. Not only that, but he also says they live naturally or they live instinctively. Again, Jude says in verse 10, they live like unreasoning animals. Now, what's true of an animal? We said this earlier. They always live like what they are. Now, let me tell you about Chubby. Chubby was the first pet that I ever owned, that, that my sister and I ever owned. 
part Kali, and then two or three other thing parts. And kind of a big dog. And uh, But when we were smaller, I mean, for the first you know, eight, nine years of our life, this was our dog, and we would ride him like a horse. Uh, we would we would saddle him up like uh, you know uh, like a bull. I mean, we would do everything with him. And Chubby had he was the most gentle, domesticated, reserved, passive dog you would ever imagine. I mean, no better dog than Chubby. And we loved Chubby, and Chubby loved us. And man, what an incredible dog! However, the day came when Faith. Kelly, who was my neighbor, who was a uh, 11 or 12 year old little girl, when we were gone, we had him chained up. But she had walked over, decided to play with him a little bit, and was teasing him a little bit. And so when we got back, we actually got a call while we were away. Chubby took a four and a half inch plug out of her head, and 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 she had been with him before. She'd been with us, and so on. And, and never, ever had Chub, Chubby showed that kind of side to him. Well, obviously, we ended up having to put Chubby down. Even though he was chained up, we left him in our yard. He was where he was supposed to be. We had to put Chubby down. Now, why did he take that out, that plug out of her head? Because Chubby's a dog. And dogs do what dogs do. Dogs bite. Because dogs aren't human beings. Dogs are animals. And dogs will instinctively bite. This is why I always love it when I go over to somebody's home. And I go in and I'm going there to visit with them. And I walk in and there's a dog that's, had, that's half the size of the kitchen. And they say, oh, no, no, come on in. Don't worry about it. He, he won't bite. He's friendly. I ha Preachers are like mailmen. There is a magnet on us that there is not a dog that God made that they won't bite a preacher. There's something in the preacher's blood they smell. And so I haven't met a dog yet that wouldn't bite me. I had one chase me up a telephone pole. I've had one chase me in the car. Because You know why? Because the nicest, sweetest, most compassionate, kindest, most domesticated dog will flat out bite you if they don't like you. Because why? That's their nature. Peter said a dog is going to return to its vomit and a pig is going to turn to its waller. In other words, you can try to take the pig out of the waller and you can put ribbons all over it and you can decorate it with pink polka dots, but you give that pig half a chance and he will have those red ribbons and those pink polka dots covered in mud before you can say big pig. Because you can take the pig out of the waller, but you can't take the waller out of that pig. Because... Pig is a pig, and it's an animal. And animals, when allowed to live like God made them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to always live just like what they are, an animal. Folks, that's what Jude says these apostates will do. They won't pray anymore. They won't read their Bibles anymore. They won't listen or talk to God anymore. They don't want God to tell them what to do anymore. They just sort of abandon anything and everything that has to do with God. They'll just sort of walk away from that. Now, in front of others, here's what's interesting. In front of you and me, they won't do that. In front of others, they're going to keep playing the game. In front of others, they're going to make sure that, that we don't know what's really true about them. And they're going to make sure that they don't know who, that we don't know who they really are. Because they want to look like something. They want to appear to be something. They want to sound like something. But listen, you're not fooling God. You can't play games with God. You're just living like what you are. A natural man when you live that way. You're just being true to your nature. Because just like an animal, you're always going to live like what you are. And so Jude says you destroy yourselves. You actually destroy yourselves in that process. It's not God's fault that you're miserable. It's not the preacher's fault or your Sunday school teacher's or the government's fault or your mom and daddy's fault that you're so miserable. No, it's your own because you are living just like what you are. And what the Bible says is that these apostates, they are lost. They are separated from God. They've never been saved, and they do not have spiritual understanding, which means they do not have the Holy Spirit of God living in them. And he talks about it in a little bit later in these verses, or in the, in the verses to come. And so Jude says that's the way the true apostate will live. They live un 
realistically. It's almost like they live in a dream world. They try to live their lives completely apart from God, without God, but yet they want everybody in front of them to think that they are the epitome of a chosen one of God. They live in this dream land. They live unrealistically and they live instinctively just like what they really are, they are. And whatever feels right, whatever feels good to the flesh, that's what they keep feeding you. That's what they do. And that's the decisions they make. You remember years ago, Susan B. Anthony uh, dollars came out. And uh, they didn't last long. You know why? Because they looked like a quarter. So they didn't last very long. But I remember Tony Evans, when he was talking about in one of his books, he was talking about uh, apostasy and apostates. And he said, you know what? He said, they really, he said, they, 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 they want to look like a dollar when in reality they're just chump change. And he was talking about these Susan B. Anthony versus a quarter. He said, they want to look like a dollar. These apostates want to look like a dollar, but in reality they're just chump change. They're not real. They're not true. And they will mislead and they will misguide and they will ultimately hurt you in the body of Christ. And so you have to be aware and you have to be sensitive and you have to discern who those people are. They've crept in unaware, and they will hurt the body of Christ. And the day will come as Jesus gets closer and closer to the return uh, of coming to this earth, and he begins to see this separation. There will, be this, there will be this sort of separating that occurs, and those that are real and those that are genuine will become more evident and more obvious, and those that aren't will become more real and more, ev- uh, more obvious. So he says you've got to be discerned. You've got to be aware. You've got to be uh, uh, observing all the time. Watch. For those that have crept into the body of Christ that seek only to destroy, to devastate, to take away instead of, instead of help in the body of Christ. And so they, they live unrealistically and they live instinctively. And then finally, he says the final error for most of them is they live dangerously. Verses 10 and 11. And this is probably some of the saddest words in all of the Bible. In verse 11, listen to what he says. He starts out verse 11 by saying this. Woe to them. Now, in our modern day lingo, in our modern day language, that whole idea of saying "woe" doesn't sound like much. It almost sounds like you're pulling back on the reins of a horse. Whoa! It seems to be less than. But when God declares a woe, it's a woe. When God declares woe, because when you get into the book of Revelation and you actually look at the latter days of the tribulation and the trumpet, the seven trumpets are going to be unsealed or, or, or blown and those, those judgments are going to occur, those five, six, and seven last judgments in the latter part of the tribulation are his woes upon this earth. And a woe in God's eyes is bad. Now a woe, woe, woe is triple bad. And so... It's one thing to hear a woe, but if you hear a woe, 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 you're in trouble. And so when God says a woe, you want to listen. And so he says here, woe to them. They've gone the way of Cain, which is simply saying they've tried to approach God on the basis of their works, their flesh, instead of uh, through the blood. He says, woe to them because they've rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, which is simply refusing to listen to God, instead listening to men for personal gain. And he says, woe to them because they per- they perish in the rebellion of Korah, which is simply the sin of rejecting the authority of Moses as God's minister over them. So God had assigned Moses over the people. God had put him in that position of leadership. God had put him in that, in that position of ministry. And yet they rejected him. They refused to abide by his direction. They refused to follow him. And so he said, hey, look, you've gone into woe to them because they've gone into rebellion of Korah. These are really parallel. These are the very same things he just mentioned in the first part of chapter 8 and 9. They were the very same things. They're parallel to those things. The way of Cain is the sin of the flesh. The error of Balaam is the sin of rejecting God's authority. The rebellion of Korah is the sin of refusing those men that God has sent to be ministers over you. They're parallel problems that he's pointing out in these verses. But his point's not the sin at this point. His point here is the consequence of their sin. And he says, here's what's happened. These men live under the wrath, the woe. They live under 
the wrath of God. In other words, it's not something that's going to come upon them one day. It's not something that's going to happen out there in the sky by and by and by, by and by somewhere one day. In other words, he's saying, no, the wrath of God, the pending sentence, damnation, and, and uh, destination of an eternal hell is already upon them. That sentence is pending already upon them. They live under the wrath of God. That's what a woe means. In fact, you can go to the book of Isaiah. You can see six woes listed there for the people of Israel. And they didn't happen immediately, but they eventually came about. They came about, and they were blown off this map when, when uh, the Assyrians came and the Babylonians came. God will follow through with his woes. And what he's saying is that you already live, these people already live under the pending sentence of God's wrath. It may not have come to pass yet, but it will come to pass. In fact, he says in, in verse 11, Jude uses the word perish, which is in the present continuous tense. It simply means they weren't dead yet, but their destiny and their doom was already sealed. It was a done deal. Do you know what? That's what the Bible says about the natural man. It's not that he's going to face the wrath of God one day. It's not that God's going to put his judgment upon him somewhere down the road. The Bible says, he who does not believe in the Son of God and obey him, the wrath of God already abides on him. The wrath of God already abides on him. And so, and so that's, that's, that's just awful news. That's why I say there's nothing worse. That, that, that verse, verse 11, is awful because it says, Woe to them. They are under that destiny. The only good thing and the only hope we have in all of this is this scripture says, Like unreasoning man. The only hope that we have in this passage is, is not that you are one. It's that there's a comparison. So the only hope that we have is to hear the word of the Lord today. It's to hear the call of God today. It's to hear his, his appeal for us to be snatched out. And Jude uses that term a little bit later in some of the other verses. To be snatched out of the devil's grip and to be pulled into his glorious uh, uh, kingdom through the call to Christ. So while we have this that looks so dismal and so dark. The glimmer of hope is in that word like. Jesus is still our only hope. And no matter how far it feels like maybe you've gone or maybe others around you have gone, the glimmer of hope that's left is the Son of God who's gone to Calvary's cross, who's paid the price for our sin, and says, I'm still waiting for you to come home. Still waiting for you to accept me. The natural man versus the saved man. God says, you can know that salvation is true. Now the question for all of us today is, what's holding us back? What keeps us in that, in that state living under that wrath of God? What keeps us living in that state? What keeps us living like a natural man, like a lost man, opposed to God? What is it that keeps us there? Is it that we love our own selves and our own authority and our own independence? The truth of the matter is you will always be enslaved to something, either to yourself and Satan or either to God himself, a servant of sin. What will you choose? The book of Jude is a caution and a call. It's a call to every one of us to be who we really are. Find out. Make sure you know. Make sure you've identified who you are. And if you can say beyond a shadow of a doubt today, I don't know, then cry out, call out to Jesus because that's what he wants us to do. That's why he's writing this. That we might come to accept Jesus. That we might know who we are and those that we stand against. Where do you stand? Who are you? Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around. Every eye closed. No one looking around.
every eye closed. That's the question for all of us. And that's the challenge that he gives us. It's to each of us to ask ourselves, to examine ourselves, and to make sure we be of this faith. That we are a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not fun, it's not good to hear the other side of the gospel, to hear the other side of grace. But Jude does it that we might understand and we might know and we might be warned. And that once and for all we would make that final decision that says, yes, I want that relationship with Jesus. I don't want to be that one that's left under that kind of wrath, the depending sentence of God upon my life. God calls you today, he calls me today to accept him as Savior and Lord. What does that require? What does that take out of each one of us? What it requires is this. It simply requires that you acknowledge that you have blown it in nine ways this morning. That you have violated God's will and God's standards. That you are a sinner both by choice and by the fact that you were born in this way. You were born by nature a sinner. Acknowledge that you're a sinner. Acknowledge your need for a Savior. Acknowledge the fact that you cannot make it to heaven on your own because the Bible tells us that our, our goodness is as filthy rags before God. It simply means there's nothing that we can do. That's what Paul says. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, not of work, lest any man should boast. So there's no good thing that we can do good enough to get ourselves to heaven. It requires the grace of the living Savior. So he calls you and me today saying, I've done all that I can do. I just need you to accept by faith what I've done for you. So he invites us today. He invites each of us to accept him by faith, to acknowledge our sin and repent of that and to move away from that and turn away from that. And to turn toward him and to accept him by faith. Placing everything we are on the finished work of Calvary. Would you do that today? Would you call out to him? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means you can come and you can tell me and I can help you and walk you through that. Or you can stand right there where you are behind those uh, pews. And you can just say, God, I'm crying out. I'm crying out. I'm crying out. But God's big enough save you right where you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done. Let him save you today. Put you on a path to redemption, purity, and holiness. Let's pray. Father God, you know our hearts. You know everything that's that's about us, God. You know us better than ourselves. And in these moments, Lord, we're aware of, of of the outcome that you set before those who choose to remain a lost, natural life opposed to you. And God, you've set before us what the outcome for them is. They already live, they already exist under that great woe, that great wrath that will come one day. So Father, I I pray that you will snatch those one, two, three, however many in this house this morning, snatch those from that fiery flame of our adversary and redeem and save them, God, and set them on a path to everlasting life. Lord, we love you, and we believe that you're able and that you're capable and that you want to to save those that need to be saved this morning. For those that have wandered away from you, God, bring us back. Draw us back closer to you that we might be all that you've called us to be. God, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, our